All right, this is Marty Wilson speaking. I'm at the Monroe County Historical Association and it's April 7th, 2022. And I'm here today with Tom Wilkins and his wife Christine's uh, in the room with us and Amy and uh, Tanya are here as well. And Tom's lived here in multi-generational families. Yes. So he goes back to his grandfather. So I'm we're, we're here to talk generation. about his uh, life and the resorts that he's been connected with and all the other things he's been connected with. So Tom, let's start with the, the beginning. Where and when were you born and who were your parents? I, I was born on April 6th, 1951 at the General Hospital in East Stroudsburg. And my mother's name was Audrey and my, far, my father's name is Morris B. Wilkins. And if you go back 71 years uh, like that, my mother was not Jewish and my father was Jewish. So I was one of the first inner, outer bred Jewish young men in the Pocono Mountains. If you go back 70 years ago, that was one of the first inner, inner denominal marriages in the oh, Poconos. Uh, yeah, you were telling me about your dad who has had a huge impact on the resort industry. Yeah. But you also mentioned your grandfather. I'd like to yeah. get that story in here. Grandpa Benny, Benjamin Wilkins, who our son, Christina and my son, is uh, named after, was a tailor on Lower Main Street, um, where, well, it's not even the unemployment office now. It, it's down by where the Warriors Bar is on Lower Main Street. And he was a tailor, but most of the time, Grandpa Benny and my Uncle Bobby uh, we had Pocono bowling lanes. We were one of the first bowling alleys in the Poconos as well, and that was Uncle Bobby. They sat in the stock market down there, and those guys were wheeling and dealing stocks all the way back then. So most of Benny's day was not tailoring your trousers, but buying Ramada stock. How about that? All of the different yeah, ones. And you had a... You had a personal role in that. Aaron. I did have a personal role in that. I got paid 25 cents for every stock that I could remember. And it was the biggest thing in town. It was one of the digital readouts and the stock would come across it. And that was like the biggest thing going. So all these guys, these old guys that sit in the back and they couldn't quite see it that well. So I got paid 25 cents. If I remembered Ramada stock were U.S. Steel, I can still remember the stocks, was trading at 25 and a quarter. And I'd go back and tell Grandpa Benny or Uncle Bobby, it's trading at 25 and a quarter now, I would make 25 cents. So on a day that, that those stocks were moving like that, I could make four or five dollars. Okay. Yeah. A lot of money for a kid in those days. Yeah, I, that was a lot of money for kids in those days. It was also the only 12-year-old in school that knew, knew what the stock market was doing. Where was that? That was where Shimsa is now? Where Shimsa is now was the original one, and it was called Loeb Roads, and that's what the stock was. Then it became Shearson and moved to the ground floor of what is now 70 Main, and then I think they moved upstairs, and I think that's where they still are today. I I don't know. Okay. Everything's online today. Yeah, that's right, of course. All right, so let's talk about your dad and uh, the invention of the heart-shaped bathtub. It all started, um, Morris was a plumber in, in Monroe County, and an electrician rather, not a plumber, an electrician. And he was doing work for Hemlock Farms, which was owned by the gentleman Brewster. Brewster, it was the Brewster estate where Hemlock Farms is today. And um, they had a uh, bunch of people up there that, that were going to shoot that day for, for birds. And they used to do it electronically or with a thing and that would release the bird and the bird would go up in the air and the people would shoot it. Well, Brewster was the one who built the George Washington Bridge in, in there. So he had this huge estate out here. They couldn't get anybody to go up on the holiday weekend. My father said, I'll, I'll do it. Went up there, stayed there, made sure everything worked. And he got to know Brewster. So he was doing a lot of the electrical work. He met a gentleman by the name of Obie O'Brien. 
And my father was this little Jewish man and Obi O'Brien was this towering Irish guy who was also doing contracting up there. They both formed a relationship and wanted to get into the resort business. They bought a little resort on, on Lake Wall and Paul Pack called the Maltac, Maltac uh, Hotel, renamed it Cove Haven, put in six harp shaped baths and were going to open up and, and start and cater to honeymooners. Well, they were all the way down the bottom of it. And the first night they were there, my father was the business end of it and Obi handled the construction. They had all the counters cleaned, everything was good. And they were waiting for their first couple to check in. One hour late, two hours late, 11 o'clock at night. And these two guys looked at one another and said, you know what, maybe this wasn't a good idea. Maybe it's not gonna work. They see these headlights coming down the hill to Cove Haven, and this couple comes to the front door. They said, you're in the middle of freaking nowhere up here like that. They couldn't find it. It was their first customer to check in. And of course, Obi took him over to his home and they made him steak and eggs and everything else. And Cove Haven started. And it went from six rooms in the, uh, the main hotel room then they built 25 rooms, then they built 100 rooms. Obi was killed in an airplane crash um, up outside of Cherry Ridge Airport, and Morris then became the sole owner of what was then just Cove Haven. And as it expanded and, and the business was there, originally you had to be on your honeymoon to, to come there. You couldn't come there for vacation or, or anything else. You had to be on your honeymoon. And honeymoons back at that, those days was one week or two weeks, or you know, you took a long period of, of time. And that's how Cove Haven started. In 19, was it 1957 that Life Magazine came out, Christine? 1955, 1957, somewhere in there, Life Magazine found out about these hard-shaped baths, came up to Cove Haven and did a full two-page spread in the Life Magazine. And it was at that point, you have to understand my father, I said this in another interview, he not only thought out of the box, he just lived outside of the, the, the box. And he called it the honeymoon capital of the world. And Life Magazine printed Honeymoon Capital of the World, and it stuck. And uh, the next thing you know, the Farda family uh, built the, the summit, Herman Martens and um, uh, Martens and Emil Wagner, who were Hungarian, uh, started Mount Airy and Pocono Gardens, and then Mr. Strickland did the Strickland's Inn. Wally uh, Hoffman did Birchwood. So all of these honeymoon were there because my father never had the money to patent the heart-shaped bath. So it was never patented at all. And they found, finally realized, which is the photograph we have Amy in, in there, they, they developed the honeymoon committee of the Vacation Bureau, which at one time was one of the most powerful committees that the Pocono Mountain Vacation Bureau had back at that time. And these guys all got together and realized that if we advertise together, if we kind of uh, do this and promote the area of the Poconos as the honeymoon capital of the world, we'll all do good. They all shook hands and that started the honeymoon capital of the world where people were coming in in the air. Marty, one of the most amazing things back then that you don't see today, these guys would compete during the day. If a bus came into Mount Pocono and you, you, you could pick them out, a honeymoon couple, we can still do it today. I can tell you right away that's a honeymoon couple. And they would be going to Mount Airy and, and it was a paradise stream because then we bought uh, uh, Pocono Palace in Marshalls Creek, Paradise Stream in Mount Pocono, and Cove Haven was what we refer to as the flagship. 
and, and Brookdale was eventually, that was bought by the family and that was a family resort and then got, got changed over. But if you saw that person was going to uh, Mount Airy or something, we would pick him up at Paradise, in the Paradise Stream and said, well, we'll take you down. We'd pull him into Paradise Stream and they would say, well, we thought we were going to Mount Airy. Well, we'll, we'll go ahead and take you here. So even though these guys were stealing honeymoon couples during the day, at nighttime, they all broke bread together. Every one of them. When did your dad buy the, the resort? What year do you remember? Uh, I, when if I was, also, Life Magazine was 1971. 71, okay. Yeah. Um, that was when they coined it honeymoon capital of the world. I think he started it about 1956 that he bought um, Cove Haven. And then except for that first glitch the first night, it took off pretty quickly. Yeah, it did. People it did. People all over the world. Let me tell you, when I was 10 years old, I used to collect stay up so it was you know, a thing that you would do in the school. And I remember um, Charles Polo, he would save every stamp that would come in, and, and I still have those stamps, but they were from all over the world. I mean, it was mail that would come in every day from all over the world for people who wanted to stay in the Poconos. And they, they, when you run a resort, you have to be very cost effective to, to go uh, there because if you don't have occupancy, it's the most perishable thing. At least a pair will last three days. If you didn't rent your room last night, it was gone forever. So you had to make sure when the guests checked out and everything else, these guys just didn't leave any stone on, on turn. They, with their marketing, with the, the rooms and the designs, they were always thinking like that. Our primary area was New York, New Jersey, and um, all the way down to Washington. So when you called up into the reservations and said, I'm gonna be getting married, they sent you a big honeymoon package and it was huge and it had everything into it. So the lead either came from the vacation bureau or it came into us direct, but we were still doing business from people around the world. Well, outside of that area, you didn't get the big honeymoon package. You got a smaller package like that. So they didn't spend as much money on the people outside the area, but people would drive from Oklahoma, Wyoming, Montana, Ohio, all of these different places to go in to the uh, come to the Poconos. Do you was there any inspiration for that heart shaped bat? Where did that come from? Heart shaped bat tub. Did he ever tell you? No, that's a that's a damn good question. I did read so. an article on that somewhere. I'll have to dig that up for you. I did read something about that. Because it's so iconic, you know. He's associated with the Poconos. Yeah, oh, no, without a doubt. There wasn't that. there wasn't a place that you could go and say hi from the Poconos. Oh, the heart-shaped bath. <laughs> I'm talking everywhere that you went. Today, it's the, the heart-shaped bath was replaced by the water park. You, you know, the heart-shaped bath and carpets on the wall and mirrors above the bed. The we had round beds. And, right, round beds and the champagne glass, uh, whatever that was called. That's patented. <laughs> so that was you guys too. Yeah, that was Morris. Morris. When, when, the, when did that? That was probably the mid-70s that that came out. There was an architect by the name of Ed Balia and Ed Malia was really um, one of these robust men and smoked a pipe and was from the island of Malta. And he could take these artists' renditions and draw it like, like this and turn it around and show you this room. And then my father and, and Dario Bellardi and some of the other ones, would they'd see it. They, they'd see it, they could see how to do it. Well, you gotta put this over here or move this over there. And they were just masterminds. They were entrepreneurs that they did. And Morris would tell the, the architect, I want them to be in a champagne glass. I want them to be in a champagne glass. And, and Ed Malia came up with a two-story champagne glass. You got into it, it was a Whirlpool bath. 
you went up the stairs like that, you got in the champagne uh, glass and it all worked. And private swimming pools. Private swimming pools oh, yeah. also in the what we called the apple at that point. We were the innovators of that. What do you mean by the apple? Uh, the, the apple was the name of the unit. And inside the apple, oh, rather than the heart-shaped bath, you got a private swimming pool. Oh, I see. So it was literally a swimming pool for two that was not even as big as this room that we're sitting and it was behind it and had the heated swimming pool in it and that's what you had. You had your own private swimming pool. How long did you did your family control the resorts? We controlled the resorts for a pretty long uh, time. Our specific uh, family. Um, the other families, the Palillos, the Fardas, the Martenses, uh, Mr. Strickland and such like that. My father, there were, there were three brothers. There was Uncle Elliot, who was with the resorts, Morris Wilkins, who was the oldest boy, and then there was Davy Wilkins. And Davy Wilkins lived in Miami. Davy Wilkins' wife uh, was a sister to the Perlman brothers. The Perlman brothers, um, my father got to meet through the wedding and everything else. Well, the Perlman brothers were from Philadelphia and they had the first franchise in the world and it was Lums, hot dogs steamed in beer. Do you remember that? Yeah, I do kind of remember. All right. That was one of the first franchises or publicly traded fast food ever going through. My father, being the stock player he was uh, as well, kind of has run down through all generations. My 12-year-old son is buying stocks and, and such. And he got to meet the Perlmans and they told him about this Lums hot dog steamed in, in, in beer. Morris liked to play the stock market. The stock was trading at 32 cents a share. My father bought a lot of Lums stock. Lums took off. When Lums took off, my the Perlman brothers sold theirs at $32 a share, as did my, my father at $32 a share. The Perlmans went to a little town in the West called Las Vegas bought a piece of property with their profits and opened up what is now today known as Caesar's Palace. So oh. that's where, that's why when you went into Caesar's Palace, there was a hot dog steamed in beer in their <laughs> lobby for the longest, longest time. Well, my father made a, a, a lot of money that day when he sold his 32 cent stock for $32, he took that money and invested in a company called Caesar's Palace. Why not? I'm going to take this. I like what they, they did there. So Caesar's Palace began. And my father was one of the largest stockholders in Caesar's Palace at, at one time. So we had a relationship with the Caesar's people. I don't know what year he sold it to Caesars. However, the 90s. yeah, it had to be in the in the nineties. In the in the nineties, Morris worked out a deal with Caesars Palace that they would buy the three resorts in the Poconos: Pocono Palace, Paradise Stream, and and Cove Haven, and they were going to do a sale leaseback. This was all being done in Miami at the old Eden Rock Hotel. My father was on the 12th floor of it. The people from Caesars, the Pearlmans, went and everybody was gathered in the room. He sold the three resorts to Caesars Palace. They said, hold on one minute. They went to the 27th floor and it turned out to be the Teamsters up there uh, the Teamsters and Mayor Lansky and, and all of that, who lent the Perlman brothers the money to take to the 17th floor 
to buy it and it would be the ultimate flaw that the Perlmans were not able to get licensed in uh, Atlantic City because of their ties to the organized crime, which all led back to one of the times, I don't know what the other ones were, the sale leaseback of the hotels or resorts in the Pocono Mountains. We have nothing to do with organized crime and whatsoever, nor did we know who was on the, my father know who was on the 27th floor, but that would be the ultimate flaw that the Perlmans had to get out of Caesar's Palace when they got gambling in Atlantic City. They had to sell out their, their rights. Huh. I often wonder why Caesars bought those resorts, and now I know. And it was, and it was a sale leaseback, so everybody made money. And plus, MGM and everybody were going to come to the Poconos, so they really thought the Poconos was going to get legalized gambling at that time, and they really fought hard during that time to get legalized gambling, um, but it never came to fruition. And the, the re, it, right, it never came to fruition, but the comical thing of it is, is that's not really the reason that Caesars bought it was for the gambling, because the cash flow that came out of these honeymoon resorts was tremendous, you know, as witnessed by the Joseph and Ann Farda addition to the hospital and the Mattioli family and all the big things that these guys did. It was a very profitable business for a long uh, period of time. It, it really, really was. Is your father still alive? No. He, he passed away. 2015. 2015. He's buried in. Yeah, he oh, passed right. away. And he retired out of out of out of there. Once the Perlmans, you have to realize the Perlmans in Caesar's Palace at that time, um, they were gunslingers. The, the, as as were the po these these are the guys that would strap their six guns on in the morning and just go out a blazing down there to to do it. Now casinos and those type things, it's all mathematics. Mm -hmm. What's our return on the customer? What's the percentages and such like that? So it all changed back then. Brookdale was actually the training camp for Sugar Ray Leonard, um, Lennox Lewis. Uh, there were a couple other fighters that would come up and train. Donnie, Donnie Lamonte, and there's pictures in our office about that. They became training camps for the big, big these big boxings. Well, how did that start? We were invited to all the fights at Caesar's Palace. And Caesar's Palace had 99.9% .9 of all the boxing matches in their uh, back parking lot. They would put these things up. So my father got introduced to these boxers as they were there and said, if Muhammad Ali originally uh, is, the, is the one who trained in the Poconos. And they said, you have a resort in the Poconos? Said, yeah, we got Brookdale on the lake. We've got a big facility in the air. And that's how these professional boxers came to the Poconos to, to train. I'm thinking of a story, now that you bring these other things I'm up. sorry, I jumped all over well, the floor. No, that's out. great. Uh, you might know about this, you might not, but I remember, I'm trying to think of the singer's name, he sang that song, Don Cashane. Remember that song? He came up here and he was gonna buy, or maybe he did Oh, buy. Wayne Newton. Wayne Newton. Wayne Newton did buy Tamamet yeah, Resort yeah. in, the, in the, the, the Poconos. And to go back to something that Christine um, said, yes, we, we definitely wanted gambling in the, in the Poconos. But we didn't want to put it at the honeymoon resorts because we didn't want a honeymooner to come up, lose their young kids, lose all their their money the first night they were they were there, and then have to sit there the rest of the the time. But the honeymoon business in the Poconos, and then I'll get back to Tamman. The honeymoon in the Poconos expanded because the people who had got married there. Ten years ago, wanted to come, we're going on our anniversary to, tonight to Mount Airy, um, wanted to come back for their anniversaries. So we can't take it because we only take honeymoons. So they finally realized, this is ridiculous. Take, take the anniversaries as well. Thus, they, be, they became forever 
Forever Lovers Club. And the Forever Lovers Club is now they wanted you to come back on your anniversary. And the more you came back on more anniversaries, the more rewards you won at the resort. So all of a sudden expanded from a honeymoon resort to an anniversary resort. Then they realized the couple's business. So it started honeymoon, went to the anniversary in the honeymoon, then it went to the couple's resorts. Well, they found out on the weekends, they could sell these rooms out to the couples that would come up just to get away for the heart-shaped bath, the champagne tower and such at the summit, Penn Hills, uh, Mount Airy and all of them. So you can see how it developed into the different types of businesses. Hmm. Oh, okay. with the hard shape bath. I wanted to say too, I did find that one article they said is in 1963 when Wilkins invented the heart shaped bathtub as a, a way to generate more honeymoon business at the hotel. The tubs cost 3000 to make and install and built the first six tubs himself, pouring concrete into heart shaped mold and covering them with red tile. He stated, I felt that the bathroom was the, the great neglected honeymoon accommodation. There already there was already action in the bedroom, but I thought there could be action in the bathroom too. <laughs> <laughs> that answered your question, Marty. <laughs> and I was probably one of the only. Did you work? Oh yeah, I, I wanted to get. I, I I I I did. I I did. I I definitely have a lot of my father in me, which my wife reminds me of every now and then. Um, I did work for them, but when I got out of high school and uh, was going to go to college, that was 69 I graduated and, and to 70. And if you remember, that was the Vietnam War and whether you were going or not, mm -hmm. and hate Ashbury and this, that, and the other thing. And uh, I did attend one semester of college, um, but we had the draft and the draft or the, um, yeah, the, not the draft. What did they call well, it? Selection the, service, they pulled in. The, yeah, they had the lottery, yeah, the, the lottery, lottery. Right. they had the lottery. Well, I pulled, my roommate pulled like number three and, and I pulled number 362. So I knew I wasn't going to be drafted at, at all. And I immediately quit college and opened up, um, which I was actually doing in high school, a little leather store. And at first I worked in Provincetown, Massachusetts and in Westport, Connecticut, where I got introduced to Paul Newman and his wife and all these high things. And we were making leather goods, even though we had long hair, as I often say, I sold beads to the hippies. You, you know, and we opened up Sundance Leather on 6th Street in Stroudsburg. And Delaware. what's that? Delaware. Well, we started on 6th Street in Stroudsburg and then we moved Sundance Leather to Delaware Water Gap, which was perfect for us. Delaware Water Gap right across from the Deerhead. You had the bottom of the Fox. You had Omega Pizza, which was uh, uh, the uh, natural pizza. And that was the Sorrenti family. And we opened up Sundance Leather. Well, Sundance Leather, even though I had long hair and my typical dress was a coyote skinned uh, leather vest with a silk opera scarf and big cowboy uh, belt and a Stetson cowboy hat and red cowboy boots was my typical work mode to, to go um, through. We were accepted by all of the people in all the doctors, wives and everything else. We were the hottest thing in, in town. So all of our handbags and everything else that we sold, and we sold a lot of them, were all accepted. So we were hippies with long hair, but we were really entrepreneurs is what we, what we were back then. You must have known Todd Mann and Tom. Oh, those are dear friends of mine. I know where Tom is now, but I, I've not been able to connect with Todd at all, at all. And I, I've, I've searched high and low. Yeah, without a doubt. Todd Mann went to the 1980 Olympics with, with me. In 1980, 
right before 1980, um, we realized that the Olympics was coming to Lake Placid. So I went to Lake Placid and was going to open up a, a leather store up there and, and see what was going to do. The Olympics were coming. Went to a local banker by the name of John Procopio, bothered a, bo borrowed $1,000 to go to Lake Placid so I could be a high roller. And you know, you had those 10 $100 bills in your pocket, man, you were somebody to, to deal with. But all the rents were so expensive, you could never, get into Lake Placid at, at, at all. So we said, well, it was a good thought. I Maybe it would have worked and we didn't. Went into dinner at a place called uh, Mr. Mike's Pizzeria. Had about maybe $700 left in my pocket. Well, wouldn't you know it, they were playing cards in the back room. So geez, well, if I don't tell Procopio or I can win the money back, I should be pretty good got into the game, turned out these guys had a little news place next to them that they were willing to, to rent out for $1,500 a, a month like that. I said, I'll, 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 I'll take it. So two years before the Olympics, we opened up in Lake Placid uh, so we could get known there. Um, but we, we needed the cowboy hat. so had a, an old, it wasn't a Stetson cowboy hat, it was another brand of some sort, went to Avenue of the Americas or Madison Avenue in New York City to the Stetson headquarters in there. A guy by the name of Ray Curley greeted me at the door and I had a motorcycle jacket, it was raining that day and everything. Thought I was the delivery boy. And, and I said, no, I've got this lease to Lake Placid, New, New York. And he looked at it and, and everything else. He said, let me take your jacket. And he took this wet motorcycle jacket, sat me down. Stetson had just come out with the Billy Kid by Stetson, where they had the cowboy hat and they put a thing on it so you could ski with a cowboy hat on. And they said, you're our place in Lake Placid, New York. So from the president of, of of Stetson, and I have that letter somewhere framed into there, we became a Stetson dealer. So every cowboy hat you saw in the 1980 Olympics, we sold. Okay. It was, it was, it was ours. So, so. Sundance Leather, Leather was where uh, Asparagus Sunshine is now. Yeah. I remember another gentleman there, tall, sort of thin. Bob guy. Greer Bob was Greer. my, was my, well, you know the Poconos pretty well yourself, Marty. Yeah. I should be interviewing yeah. you. Yeah. Bob, Bob Greer, Greer was, wife, was Kat. my, and Kathy, Kathy Sweeney. Sweeney, right. They, they were my partners. Bob went and, and stayed. When I moved down to Delaware Water Gap, Bob was one of the squatters in, in, uh, there, but he knew leather and he knew it really, really well. No business sense, but he was a great craftsman. So we kind of became partners in, in there that he helped us out. And then he didn't have anything to do with Lake Placid. He, he was not a gambler or a risk taker as I was. Um, so we went up to Lake Placid, did Lake Placid. After Lake Placid, we came back and I realized um, the, the leather business just wasn't gonna work. The cowboy had uh, John Travola came out with Urban Cowboy and jumping around and this and that and disco was starting to come out. I said, I gotta get out of this freaking cowboy business fast, man. I see this coming down. This is, again is a true story. Gambling at Caesars in Atlantic City, uh, like that, with my Stetson cowboy hat on, of which I had a uh, collection of Stetson cowboy hats, second to, to none. These two guys tapped me on the shoulder. Where did you get that hat? And I said, well, look, this hat, I got thousands of these hats up in the Poconos like that, and, and explained to them about the Olympics. They were from Miami. They said, we want to buy your store. Yeah, that'll, that'll work for me. We left the casino. We drove to Brookdale on the lake. Herbie, the chef there, made us breakfast at six o'clock in the, in the morning like that. We had breakfast at, at Brookdale, went to Sundance Leather, and they proceeded to buy everything.
I'll take this, I'll take this. The only thing I didn't sell was the cash register because I figured I may need that if I, if I have to go back in business. So we kept the cash register. Two weeks later, and they came up, everything went out. I was out of the leather business. Called my father and said, you know, this is great, but uh, I don't have a job. I, I, don't, I don't know what to, to do. What, what am I gonna do? And I, I wanted to go to Lake Tahoe because Caesars had a casino in Lake Tahoe and that's where I wanted to end up. Long story short, I, I started at the Caesars Pocono Resort um, carrying a gentleman's name, uh, Dario Bellardi, carrying his briefcase and driving him to the Poconos and driving them around. And they finally realized this kid's got some smarts and worked my way up until I was the director of sales of the Caesars Pocono uh, properties based out of, out of Cove Haven. So for probably close to five years, I worked in the resort business as a member of the executive committee and making that. And I had a stepbrother by the name of uh, Michael and Uncle Elliot Wilkins was there. Morris, of course, was there and all of these other guys to get to, to know. And I became very dear friends with all the other resort owners. The Farda family, the Mattioli family who had Pocono International Raceway, um, Penn Hills, uh, Mr. Strickland, all of them. There wasn't a lot of money in the uh, resort business at those days. And I was an entrepreneur by heart. And I uh, said, I, I, I got to get back to working for myself. And uh, interviewed with a small company by the name of Davis R. Chant Realtors and uh, Pete Helms and Dave Chant and said to them, uh, I, I want to get out of the resort business. I, I, I want to get there. I had already been buying and selling real estate at, at that point, you know, quite a lot. And they kind of thought I was kidding. There was a young lady who was local in the Poconos by the name of Phyllis Rubin. And Phyllis Rubin owned Coldwell Banker. She was the first franchise in the, the Poconos. She owned Coldwell Banker, Phyllis Rubin Real Estate. And I heard that one of her competitors were coming to Mount Pocono. Well, obviously they're a Jewish family as well. It's called Phyllis up. Phyllis, they're, they're, your competitor is coming to Mount Pocono. And I thought I'd better tell you just in case you wanted to do something about it. Phyllis said, oh, if I only had a manager, I'd open up in Mount Pocono. I said, well, I'll keep my eyes open and hung the phone up. And about three minutes later, thought, you schmuck, call Phyllis back like that. So Phyllis, I'll be your manager in typical Phyllis tradition. Meet me tomorrow. And we met for lunch. And the following morning, I was sitting at a desk at Coldwell Banker Phyllis Rubin Real Estate as a real estate agent and uh, was with Phyllis probably maybe three years or four years, opened up her commercial, got very deep into real estate, realized through all the learning I had from the Caesars Pocono Resorts how to run a business. We had to answer every month to Las Vegas, income, expenses and such. So. That was really my college education, the years I spent at Caesars Pocono Resorts uh, like that. And I was kind of destined to buy Coldwell Banker Phyllis Rubin Real Estate. That was the game plan. Phyllis would retire, I would buy Coldwell Banker, and we would become a Coldwell Banker uh, franchise. Didn't work out that way. I was looking to get into real estate a lot deeper than what Phyllis was, so and we couldn't make a deal, so we opened up Wilkins and Associates Real Estate in 1988. Was, yeah. yeah, it was 88 or 89. I know I kind of lied about it because I didn't want to say we just opened uh, like that, so I kind of added a, a year on here and here and there. And we opened up Wilkins and Associates Real Estate in Mount Pocono with three people. Me, one agent, and my secretary, Susie Kent, 
who I took from the reservations department of Caesars and uh, Susie worked for us. And we, we, we worked. Our first buyers, as I said earlier, were really the people that honeymooned in the Poconos. Well, we stayed at Mount Airy on our honeymoon and we love it up here. We want to buy a house. Well, I was a natural because I knew all the resorts, knew all of this. So it was fairly easy for us to get in with that type of a customer. Ten years later, it changed at a point that the, the people coming in to buy a house worked with these original people that honeymooned. They never honeymooned at Mount Airy. Mount Airy was probably gone at that point or, or any of the resorts, but their co-workers worked here and they wanted to live here. So that was the second phase that came into it. Then it was like extended family because those people's kids lived in the Poconos. And that's really how the vacation or the Poconos changed from a resort area into what it is today. Which is a bedroom community. Mm -hmm. it's, it, the Poconos needs to figure out what they want to be when they grow up is what they really need to do. Yes, we're a bedroom community. You've got some big resorts that are here. They're talking about moving industry into the Poconos, which we don't really have the infrastructure for. So there's a lot of different things happening in the Poconos now. Yes, we're a bedroom community. Then all of a sudden Airbnb, where the hell did Airbnb come from? in there. Now, all of a sudden, the, the people and <laughs> Christine, my, my wife and I both did what we called short term rentals back then. We throughout the entire area, Christine in Penn Estates in, into there. And we met at a Christmas dinner, sat across from one another. I thought to myself, who the heck is this girl on the other side of the table? Number one, she's beautiful in the air. And they said, Charlie, her father introduced us and, and went and said, that's Christine. And, and said, that's Tom Wilkins. Well, she looked at me and I looked at her and we thought, wow, we're competitors in the air. So I as know. we're kind of eating, it's like that. It's like, well, how much are you charging for housekeeping? Well, we're charging 85. Why? What are you charging? Oh, we're getting 90. Really? Yeah, All these and, questions Charles would ask, and I was, I was like, this guy's trying to come in on my territory. Like, I was all in Penn and he's trying to move in my community now. <laughs> and, I, and I fell in love at, at, uh, at dinner. At that dinner, I, I, I fell in love. Marty, the Poconos has got to figure out. We're more than a bedroom community for the Poconos now. Um, and as, the, as our landscape is going to change again over the next couple of years, there are several thousand townhomes that are in the zoning process now. You've got Smithfield Gateway has got 200 houses. You've got another large 300, 400 acre parcel um, up Route 402 that's bringing in conceptual plans. You've got Shawnee uh, area. You've got Brookdale, Camelback, Village of Camelback, not, not the village, but Camelback proper, which is now new owners, not owned by the Berry family anymore. They're looking at putting in townhouses and the national builders, the Toll Brothers, the Ryan Homes, the U.S. Homes, are saying to these guys, you get us 400 townhomes approved in, in the Poconos, ground ready to go through, we'll buy every one of them from you. So the Poconos is going to go through another change um, in the not too distant future. Hmm. I saw recently, didn't I, that Phyllis Rubin just died? Yeah, 93. Yeah. She was definitely my mentor. I learned from from Phyllis. It's too bad we didn't have a chance to interview her. She, oh, she was she she was a genius in real estate. You were going to say something about Tamman earlier? Or? Oh, well, Tamman. 
Um, Tanamit, a uh, gorgeous hotel. Did you ever get to see Tanamit? Yeah. Oh my God, just absolutely gorgeous. You walked into that and it was like walking into Lake Tahoe. It really was in, into that. Um, Wayne Newton came in. Uh, gambling almost came into the Poconos, the 70s. What was it? Yeah. I'm really b bad at time, but I can still re see the Pocono record um, when they were trying to get the train in. That's when they were saying gambling is coming to the Poconos. And, and of course it was being fought. The geniuses of back then, Wayne Newton bought Tamamen, a guy by the name of Steve Wynn, uh, took an option on Charles Palillo's 43 acres down off of 447 and I-80 there. It's now college dormitories. He took an option on that property to build a casino yeah, just is. in case it was, uh, was passed. And here's how smart Steve Wynn is. He also went to the pasture in Tannersville that was fighting against the gambling coming to the Poconos and funded him. So he was playing both sides okay. of the coin. He had his bet covered if it doesn't come together and he had his bet covered if it, if it were going to get passed and the pastor didn't win. He had himself covered every way. Well, it never went anywhere. And Do you remember the pastor's name? No, uh, you know, there's one article I've got. I can't for the life of me. He was from Tannersville, though. You, you re do, do you remember? I remember this. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, yeah, yeah. This, uh, I don't remember his name, Marty. I, I, not to get off uh, focus here, but I was at Tannament the night that Wayne Newton came. I got to see Wayne Newton at Tannament. Did night. you? Yeah. But anyway, let's get back to Well, that. and then Tannament fell into disrepair, um, an organization by the name of um, Worthington, I think, they build school buses. Wow. If you go behind a school bus, you'll see in the very bottom it says mm -hmm. Worthington or something to that effect. That family bought Tamamen and they were going to do all the remaining lots and become builders and the kid wanted to become a builder and everything else. And for some unbeknownst reason, he demolished the hotel. It's, it's gone. Yeah. And they ended up losing it. I think it's owned by one of the banks or one of the REITs or hedge funds or something at, at this point. They did not prosper real well in the Poconos because I think even either, either you said it or I said it, doing business in the Poconos is a little different. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta know what you're doing doing business in the in the Poconos because we're such a unique animal. We're a bedroom community. We're the, the, the baths, the, the heart-shaped things. And, and you really got to know business cycles in the Poconos, they don't go gradually and get up to there. They go skyrocketing straight up and they can go fall immediately the same thing. And if you're not, ad and I learned that from these re resort guys, some of which uh, Charles Palillo fought to, to the dying day to keep uh, Penn, Penn Hills going like that. But the market had changed, honeymooners weren't in. They invented sandals. They had a $99 flight that you could get on and go to the islands for your honeymoon. It was written all over the world. We're, 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 it's over. It was a good run, as we like to call it. I can remember waking Christine up at 4.30 in the morning and saying, we're closing five offices today. And she just looked at me and said, okay. And right? yeah, if that's what we've got to do, that's what we've got to do because you have to be that immediate because our market in the Poconos can change on a dime. Uh, you told me some... Uh, some fascinating stories here, and I don't want to <laughs> hold you up here. But I, you're I, not. We haven't you're really not. talked about. You mentioned earlier that you were your was it your father was Jewish and your mom was not. Or yeah. Was, uh, what was it like for you? Was there is there a story there? 
for a, a Jewish boy growing up in the Poconos? Or yeah, there, there, there is, and and I'll I'll start that story by saying there is a very, very, very happy ending. Um, being that age, or or seventy years ago, I mean that was just a no no. My my grandfather was not a big proponent of of this at all. But my mother and my father fell in love and they they married. So back then, then when they did get divorced, uh, and I was raised primarily by my mother and my my grandmother non-Jewish because you're you're Jewish if the mother is Jewish you're not if the father is is Jewish so I was ousted from the Jew from the my immediate Jewish family but the one interesting thing about it is the Jewish community back then the Scheinbaums the Zegers uh, the Rubens all of them all took me in the, it, in their mind, there wasn't anything wrong with that. You were, you were Morris's boy, come on in. So I was so fortunate to, to Krowitz, all these old Jewish families, most of which are dead now, that would tell me the stories about the synagogue when it started where the Burger King is in East Stroudsburg now, and went on to Wallace Street and the, the paying off of the mortgage and how they, they grew and everything else I, I knew. Um, it wasn't until uh, a couple years ago that, that we, I was sitting with Rabbi Melman and we were talking about marketing and they wanted to do more with the Jewish community. Phyllis had left. Phyllis controlled the Jewish community while she was in the Poconos when Phyllis left the Poconos and retired, then the majority of the Jewish business came over to, to us and we started to, to handle that business. Met this rabbi, talked talk to him through the encouragement of, of my wife, Chris, Christine, um, to cut a real long story short, I converted and became a converted uh, Jew. Oh, so yeah. today, a full Jew. So today, as I sit here, I'm a, I'm a member of the Temple Israel, and my founding members are Benjamin Wilkins and Rose Wilkins, his, uh, his wife, Grandma Rose, and it all came full circle. And I didn't know it was right in front of my nose until it was right in front of my nose. Sounds like it was a tight-knit community. Oh, pretty much so. Yeah. You knew everybody. Was there a discrimination? Did you ever experience any discrimination? Never at all. Ne never, not, not really. I've, number one, I've been in a business that there, whether it was the resort business or Sundance Leather or real estate now, we've never discriminated in, into there. It just isn't in our, our blood whatsoever. I mean, have you been the victims of discrimination? In it? No, no, not at all. Not, right. not at, not at all, not at all. I was just welcome with welcome arms, and and all I had to do was in my own mind kind of forgive my grandfather and make amends to to there that it's a happy ending. Did I miss anything? Forgive your grandfather. For well, you. my grandfather, my grandfather was. Um, uh, Hasidic Jew. So when you have a marriage of a non-Jew and a Jew oh, like oh, that, and they separated oh, in his eyes, quote unquote, I was, I was dead. There, there was, there was none in, in the air. I mean, I can remember going to his door once and knocking on and saying, Grandpa Benny, it's me, Tommy. And the door just being closed with Grandma Rose in the back crying because she couldn't see me. It, it was there, but that's not discrimination, Marty. That's how, that's how, that's how the Jewish faith was. That's, that's what they did. Now, probably 90% of the, 80% of the, of the Jewish churches and such like that are either full of converts or the wife isn't Jewish or the husband isn't Jewish. So non-denominal marriages now are, are commonplace. It just wasn't in the Poconos 
71 oh. years ago. Huh. You must have known Tom Breslauer. Oh my God. I was so fortunate. I've been such a fortunate man and I'm lucky and I, I don't ever question why uh, like that. W without a doubt, Tom Breslauer, all of the Jewish community accepted me in. There wasn't any problem. Yeah. And the young lady that he was with for the longest time. Camille. Camille. Camille, yeah. yeah. Just ran into her the other day. Yeah. And Jack Birnbaum. And, Ch and the Kahn family, Charlie Kahn and Danny Kahn. And, and the, the, there was another brother that, yeah, I knew them all. Wow. And was accepted by them all. Yeah. Well, you've told some fascinating stories here. Have we missed anything? Is there something we should have asked? What, what did your mom do for a living? My mom what was, was my, yep, my, my mom was the credit manager at uh, Sears and Roebuck when Sears and Roebuck was behind Wyckoff's. My grandmother was the payroll master of Wyckoff's itself. So I grew up with the, the knowing the Mr. Wyckoff and, and everything else and ran all around and everybody from Wyckoff's knew me. But I was the only, only kid with long hair that, that they were fine with. They had no problem with me whatsoever. I could walk into any, anything into there because I was Tommy. Well, you had all those quarters too. From yeah. Those yeah. Quarters. yeah. I want to say also with the Delaware I Got Jazz Festival. Oh, yeah. That's how it started, really. Was yeah. The, the Delaware Water Gap Jazz Festival, um, where you're saying Asparagus Sunshine. Did you know Rick Chamberlain? Yeah, sure. Very well. Dear, dear, dear friend of mine was also in Lake Placid with Chuck Mangione, who did one of the opening ceremonies, as was Todd Mann, who was in the kitchen prepping for the Swiss Lodge, where all of the um, Austrian skiers were, were staying at there, as did Potbelly Stove, who was playing music down at that little rinky-dink bar right by the, the ice skating rink. All of us seem to have, have gone up there. Um, uh, when we started the jazz festival, we, uh, there was the, there was Ed Jobert, who was since deceased from the bottom of the Fox, mm -hmm. uh, Walter Bishop, who was the nationwide insurance, uh, salesman in Delaware Water Gap and wore a tie and everything else. He, he was the most comical guy like that. He hung out with the rest of us and it was just like he was one of us. So now nah, I've never, never been discriminated against and there. Um, Jerry Harris, uh, Rick Chamberlain and my, myself, and we were going to do this jazz festival. And we thought that it was a great, great thing. And, and we started it in conjunction with that. Phil Woods lived in, in Delaware Water Gap. All the musicians that live out in the Poconos that are studio musicians and everything else, there was hundreds of them that, that were there and that's where the jazz festival really started. How about that? Yeah, and then it was right after that. There, there is a collection and honest to God, I'd love to see it um, at, at one time. And I'm, I think Rick's daughter has got it. Of all the posters, that were made, a lot of them by Tom Mann in the early days like that, that would fill that whole world, wall up with them. And I don't know who has that, but I know it's out there somewhere. Yeah, actually a lot of people try to collect them, you know. I think I had all of them at one point. Did you really? Yeah, but then we gave them to my granddaughter who got real excited about it, so, yeah. She, she didn't get excited about it? She, she did. did. Oh, yeah, she, she did. Yeah, I was surprised that she wanted them, so we gave them to her. Oh, yeah. Well, I think, I think Rick's daughter has got a complete collection. Yeah. I know they're out there. We have a couple mm -hmm. uh, like, like that. We have the Milford one in, in there. But yeah, that would be a collector's item. What we do have is the 14 days of the Winter Olympic, all the newspapers that were out right. there. And we had the back page of it. And I'm just an entrepreneur is in my, my blood. We had a, a girl and a guy in the cowboy hat and the fringe jacket and the Toomey bags 
like that. And then we had cowboy hat in Chinese, uh, <laughs> Chinese, Italian, and maybe two other languages there. And we had the back page, the whole full back page, because I learned from the resorts that if you do cooperative advertising, so I called up Stetson and said, look, we can have the back page of this. So I never paid a dime for it. Stetson paid for part of it. Toomey paid for part of it. And somebody else, maybe I paid for the other third. So we had the full back page of it. That collection I still have. Yeah, very neat. I know there was a place that would probably love to have that collection someday. So do I. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think my, my oldest son has uh, kind of yeah. warned me, Dad, don't he do anything with like that, <laughs> okay? It be, because... well, maybe after that. <laughs> yeah, I'll have to tell where it goes yeah, afterwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a nice collection. Yeah. It's, it's cool. Please come out to our office. It, the, 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 that display is out there. The original um, uh, heart shape of the photos, you're, you're more than welcome to, to uh, do it. Sounds good. All right, well, anything else that we should I'm ask not you? sure. Okay, sure, I was going to say, um, I'm not sure. No, I think you had a great life. Yeah, no. Oh, I, I'm the luckiest guy you've run into in, in a long, long time. And then we've been so fortunate, um, probably one of the only guys, and he can't do this today. And of course, none of my kids did it. They've gone to their with a, a, a high school education and opening a business at 19, I've, I've never really worked for anyone that entire amount of time. Mm -hmm. And I kind of look back at that and say, wow, I can't, can't believe I did that. When I went with Phyllis Rubin, and oh, there is one other story I've got for you, Marty. There is one other story that I've got for That's you. Wilkins and Associates Real Estate. We're doing, we're doing <laughs> great. You know the story. <laughs> we're, we're, we're doing great. We're d down at 304 Park Avenue down there. Everything is good. I, I see, and, and our, we, but we wanted a franchise. I could never get a, a franchise. There was none out there. I didn't want an ERA or a Century 21 like that. Um, and we're certainly not a Sotheby's area like that. Well, all of a sudden I'm reading an article and the Better Home and Gardens name, um, I flew to Miami, uh, GMAC, if you remember them, bought the, the Better Home and Gardens name, the, the trademark of it. And then they put it on the shelf and changed all the BHG to uh, BHG offices, Better Home and Gardens offices, to GMAC financing, which failed miserably. So the Better Home and Gardens name sat in a drawer for years like that. Um, a company by the name of Realogy that was uh, broken out from Sendent. Remember Sendent? The, uh, that's another whole Rich conversation. Yeah, the, 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 that's another whole story. Reading this thing, it's saying that they're going to offer better home and gardens franchises. I look at this thing and say, oh my God, you gotta be kidding me like that. Well, I had known people inside the Realogy offices. I had been in and out of their offices where with a pair of sunglasses on, they never even knew it like that, where these guys would help me out and this and that, we became very dear friends, Tom Scholler, uh, Peter Turzo. Called up Churchill and said, what well, is this Better Home and Gardens? Yeah, we just licensed it through Realogy like that. It's so exciting to go through. I said, I'll be there tomorrow. I want to buy a franchise. Well, but we're not quite ready. I don't care whether you're ready or not. I'm going to be there at 10 o'clock in the morning. And I want the, the franchise. Down to New Jersey, my, my daughter and I go. And we're sitting on this side of the table and on the other side of the table are about eight or nine different people from Realogy or Better Home and Gardens Real Estate, the people that sold the franchise. It wasn't ready to be marketed. What they considered me would they on their end, and I knew what they were thinking, this is a dry run. Let's see what questions he asks and this and that. We'll be able to go into really fine tune our presentations and we'll use this guy as a gimme, and that's why they were all there. 
listening to inner pitch and everything else to go through. They were about three quarters of the way through it. And finally I went and I said, I'll take it. And they said, you'll take it? And I said, yeah, I'll take it. You can stop pitching me on it here. I'm, I'm pretty good. We, we want to do it. Don't you know, we were the first Better Home and Gardens real estate franchise that Realogy did under their name in 2007 Seven. like that to go through. The first one that's in the world, that, in the world wow. really, in, in there. So they, they come and we open up, they had to make the announcement to the world that they had done this. So they came out to the Poconos, a young lady by the name of Sherry Chris, who's still there and is president of the Better Home and Gardens and, and ERA. We opened up as a Better Home and Gardens office, told all of our agents. They then flew us to California, where now that they had a franchise, they had to let the world know. So I would, and Meredith, which is the publishing company of the magazine, Better Home and Gardens Real Estate, and the cookbook and other magazines, et cetera. And then we announced to the world that we were the BHG and we were introduced as the first franchise holder of Better Home. We're still introduced today. Yeah, still, still they, they always, recognize us when we go to an event. And Realty, if you don't understand, that's, um, Realty is a parent corporation um, that owns all the ERAs, Century 21s, the Better Home and Gardens, Sotheby's, Sotheby's some other ones. So that, that's how kind of the, in the real estate world, when you go all the way to the top works and then you can buy a franchise, but this way they offer different services, but they also have a uh, big market game overall in the world. We were the first one. And we were the very first Better Homes and Gardens. Uh, so talk about a guy who's hit it first a couple times. Morris Wilkins with the heart-shaped bath, me with the cowboy hat and Lake Placid, Better Home and Gardens real estate. And yeah. All right, well, that's a good note to end on. I want to thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you.